Over a relatively short time frame, China has experienced rapid economic growth. As noted in the previous module, Chinese development is the primary reason why the first millennium development goal, having the number of people living on less than a dollar per day, will be met. This is not to say that Chinese development has been unproblematic, but given its rapid pace and the fact that so many other countries are trying to accomplish what China has, it's worth exploring whether or not there might be a Beijing consensus. The term Beijing consensus was first coined in 2004 by Joshua Ramo in an op-ed for the Financial Times. In it, Ramo wrote, the two countries that most pointedly ignored pressure from the development giants such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to obey the Washington consensus now have records that speak for themselves, China and India. Though fraught with contradictions and riddled with problems, China's model is now seducing leaders in countries as different as Brazil, which is sending teams to study Be Beijing, and Vietnam, now probing the philosophy of Jiang Zemin, the former Chinese president, for business tips. He went on, the Beijing consensus is a development approach driven not by a desire to make bankers happy, but by the more fundamental urge for equitable, high-quality growth, because no other formula can keep China from exploding. The goal, growing while holding on to independence. But before we explore what the Beijing consensus looks like, it's useful to briefly consider China's unique history and pattern of development. China, of course, has a long and celebrated history, home to one of the world's oldest civilizations. Indeed, considerable ink has been spilt debating why Europe, rather than China, colonized the world. From the fall of Rome to the Age of Discovery, China was the most technical, technologically advanced nation in the world. They boasted more advanced shipbuilding technology, more advanced weaponry, superior military tactics, and a more unified, efficient, and powerful state. And yet they never really moved to colonize the world. China's modern history has been, been a bit more turbulent. In 1949, the Chinese Civil War, which had been underway since the 1930s, ended, with the Communist Party of China, under the leadership of Mao Zedong, taking power. Under Mao's leadership, China took, undertook a series of five-year plans intended to develop the economy. By nearly every account, Mao's plans were dramatic failures. The Great Leap Forward, introduced in 1958, attempted to transform the countryside through the collectivization of farming, and to rapidly industrialize the Chinese economy under a vision of Chinese communism. In reality, it resulted in a massive famine in which 18, between 18 and 45 million people are believed to have perished. As one historian observed, coercion, terror, and systematic violence were the very foundation of the Great Leap Forward. Following on the heels of the failed Great Leap Forward, Mao reinforced communist ideology through a great proletarian cultural revolution. This revolution was intended to remove all traces of capitalism from China and to impose Mao's orthodox vision. Revisionists were sought out, intellectuals were purged, and power was concentrated in the party. The cultural revolution only drew to a close following Mao's death in 1976. But with Mao's death, a new generation of leaders emerged. Deng Xiaoping, who had been expelled from the Chinese Communist Party during the Cultural Revolution, was eventually named as Mao's successor. Deng quickly moved China into a more pragmatic direction, embracing some elements of capitalism in what he called socialism with Chinese characteristics, or a socialist market economy. For Deng, Privately owned enterprises could operate alongside state owned enterprises and collective enterprises in a mixed economy. The state would still play a central role, controlling key industries like armaments, power generation, aviation and shipping, telecommunications, and key resource extractive industries. But the private sector could also play a role. As Deng is famously said to have argued, it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. Deng cared less about whether a particular policy was socialist or capitalist than it did about whether or not it promoted growth. Deng's policies, in other words, set the stage for China's rapid rise on the global stage. By nearly every measure, China's economic growth is nothing short of miraculous. 
Since 1978, China's gross domestic product has increased from $53 billion to more than $4.2 trillion, making China the world's second largest economy to the United States. In per capita terms, China's GDP increased from $154 per person in 1978 to $3,170 in 2008. As a result, the proportion of the population living in poverty, defined by the World Bank as people living on less than $1.25 a day, declined from 84% in 1981 to about 16% in 2005. At the same time, China's foreign reserves increased dramatically from just under $145 billion in 1998 to almost $2 trillion by 2008. Today, it's estimated that China holds about $3.5 trillion in foreign exchange reserves, making it the largest owner of U.S. Treasury bills outside the United States. The economic model that made China's dramatic growth possible was predicated on maintaining political and social stability while facilitating sharp increases in the economic productivity. The state maintained firm control over the political realm while selectively liberalizing portions of the economy. Government policy was directed towards raising levels of personal income and consumption, particularly in the cities. The success of economic policies was judged by the degree to which programs contributed to economic growth without exacerbating inflation or unemployment or increasing budget deficits. Above all then, the Beijing consensus promoted a pragmatic, long-term approach to development grounded in local conditions specific to the Chinese experience. Unlike the United States, where shareholders would expect profits to be delivered by the next quarter, quarter China could afford to take a long-term perspective, sacrificing short-term returns on investment for longer-term advantage. The political system, however, remained fundamentally non-democratic. It was not until it, it was economic, not political liberalization that guided Chinese development. The state remained willing to use the repressive apparatus of the state to quell political dissent, as the events of Tiananmen Square in 1999 attest. In April 1999, thousands of Chinese students occupied Tiananmen Square in central Beijing. Protesters had many demands, ranging from concerns over their career prospects and demands for greater social equality, to expanding freedom of speech and freedom of the press, as well as calls for broader democratization. They occupied Tiananmen Square to draw attention to their cause. The government responded by declaring martial law and deploying 300,000 soldiers to Beijing. The protests were violently put down. In the aftermath, hundreds of dissidents were imprisoned and the government imposed strict new controls on the press. The fate of the unknown dissident pictured here, known only as the Tank Man, remains unknown. It was clear that economic liberalization and growth in China need not necessarily be encompassed by political liberalization and democratization. And this suggests the first limit of the Beijing Consensus. Like the South Korean experience, the Chinese experience suggested that economic growth, even when it results in general improvement in the quality of life for the people of a country, need not involve democratization. Indeed, economic growth models can be fundamentally undemocratic. Additionally, Chinese development, while impressive on the overall level, has been incredibly uneven on a regional dimension. Economic growth has been concentrated in the eastern provinces, while growth in the more rural regions in the west has been much slower. As this map shows, the wealthier urban provinces in the east, like Beijing and Shanghai, have GDPs per capita of more than $20,000, while rural provinces in the interior, like Gansu, Tibet, and Zhizhou, have per capita GDPs of less than one-fifth that level. This is the second limit of the Beijing Consensus. It has been unable to address regional inequalities, particularly between rural and urban areas of the country, creating a perception of two Chinas, an urban, more modern China, and a rural traditional China. Chinese development has also depended on the success of state-owned enterprises. While there's a widely shared perception in the Washington Consensus that state-owned enterprises, or SOEs, are by definition uncompetitive and inefficient, the Chinese experience suggests that, that, this, that this need not necessarily be the case. 
In 2012, SOEs were responsible for half of all Chinese production and employed over half of all Chinese working citizens. 65 of the Chinese companies listed on the Fortune 500 in 2012 were SOEs, and profits from the largest SOEs dwarfed those from the private sector in China, which is comprised primarily of small and medium-sized businesses. China's model of industrialization has also been incredibly polluting. A 2007 report by the World Bank concluded that 16 of the world's 20 most polluted cities are in China. Deforestation has taken place at a rapid pace, particularly as China seeks to take advantage of natural resources it has in the western provinces. Rivers have become polluted to the point that they are unfit for direct human use. The, Ministry of, the release of environmental pollutants has made cancer the leading cause of death, according to the Chinese Ministry of Health. An estimated 300,000 people die annually as a result of ambient air pollution. And there is growing concern within the Chinese government that declining environmental quality may generate social unrest among Chinese youth in the future. Finally, it's important to acknowledge that despite China's impressive track record of economic growth, Chinese development was predicated on a unique relationship with the United States. Because China became the world's largest treasury holder of U.S. Treasury bills by regularly running a trade balance deficit, excuse me, a surplus. But remember that trade surpluses or deficits must be accounted for by balance of payments. China chose to finance its balance of payments by purchasing trillions of dollars worth of U.S. Treasury bills. Some worry that this may give the Chinese government undue influence over U.S. policy. But in reality, it, it can also be viewed as an interesting situation of dual dependence. China holds trillions of U.S. dollars, and the value of its currency, the renminbi, is closely tied to the value of the U.S. dollar. As a result, it's in China's interest, as much as that of the United States, to continue this relationship. So does the Chinese model represent a potential path for economic development in the global south? As with the South Korean case, it's important to bear in mind both the historical specificities and the historical conditions that gave rise to the Beijing consensus, as well as its contemporary limits. Given those limits, it's not clear that China's experiences represent a generalizable model for the rest of the global south.